just to make sure you were paying attention, you can check out whether you agree with Harry McGee's version of what they said. Harry, would you please do a summation for us? Where is he? Thank you. Easy. <laughs> okay, it's the first time I've heard summation, but uh, <laughs> we wait. Okay, there's uh, just two uh, Beecher's Brooks and Superl objects between you and your Sambos. Um, I hope that I'll provide the, the lesser challenge, Jim. Um, um, the Uptron uh, and will be uh, speaking after me. Gormila Magi, as the Inshah, Nokta, as Harkan, on Haman, Kemah, and Yugam Leshkel, Cap Mefengra, Kaidan, the Dispork, the Inshah, and Yuvisha, Larry Shivka Folosuk, Krausha, on Ord or Fad, as is Lerguil, on Hrediv, as Space, as Mishnuk, as Mianma, Egdini. A Gursi sport in Shah, as an old school Shah and Aliyev, as a skintical Khulidina, a Giri, a Tawalikela, a Waha, Lesha Galoshta in Shah in Aliyev. So I was invited up here because of my expertise in one particular sporting discipline, and it's a blood sport. Uh, it's called uh, technically uh, knifing each other in the back, <laughs> and it's a uh, Crow Park or Aviva Stadium is the floor of the Doyle Chamber in Leinster House. What I'm saying is, seldom have I ever felt less qualified to address an audience as I have today. And I felt bad about it this morning, but then I realised that Sean O'Rourke was also speaking, so I didn't feel too bad. <laughs> <laughs> now, that said, I did actually play in goals for the Fitzgibbon Cup team uh, a long, long time ago, and Joe Connolly uh, was our trainer, and uh, Colm also laboured with us on that team as well. And my uh, greatest privilege was picking uh, a ball from the net that had been delivered by Swift Post by one Nicholas English, who was then playing for UCC. And that's how long ago it was. The debate this morning was fascinating and at times almost matched the intensity of the last 10 minutes of last uh, Saturday's game between Galway and Kilkenny in terms of passion, obduracy, and that little bit of timber that we saw being displayed from time to time. Uh, our two uh, keynote speakers, uh, Nasa Folan, of Lashta Ignor Jingaliev, same school as myself, and uh, uh, Gary Keegan gave uh, amazing speeches, and both were extraordinarily interesting. And what struck me most uh, about them uh, were the focus and clarity they displayed in terms of identifying needs and problems, and most importantly, because this is what they do in identifying solutions for those needs and problems. So um, it was just amazing to hear presentations from both of them. Uh, it's evident why both are at the top of their game in what they do. Now, the panels came from a, a diversity of backgrounds and a diversity of disciplines, but it struck me listening to them that there was, there was at least a commonality in some of what they had to say, even though there were divisions. Um, but they, uh, there was a lot of things said about the need for NUIG to strive for excellence in terms of individual athletes and also in terms of collective uh, team sports. And some of the themes we had this morning uh, and I think the Alumni Association uh, might have a role in terms of you know, participating in a strategy in the future in terms of identifying uh, where UCG or NUIG can uh, excel in terms of um, programmes, in terms of facilities, in terms of tailoring individual programmes, in terms of identifying, maybe cherry picking, as somebody said, perhaps some sports uh, for special attention, but also in mining those areas, which seem to be the most fascinating areas of all, in terms of using the academic excellence that we have, the gown that we have here to benefit the town in terms of research, uh, not necessarily going down the sports science route, but looking at the disciplines that are there already in terms of drawing in expertise from them in terms of uh, providing research that will benefit uh, sports. And then, of course, uh, it would be uh, bereft of me not to mention Caroline Murphy, who brought great perception and incisiveness to her role as chair. And that clearly reflected her time as a highly respected and authoritative sports presenter uh, producer and executive within RG. And thank you very much indeed, Caroline, for your contribution today. Uh, NASA referred to the Olympian motto of Sitius Altius Fortis. I am an Irish Times journalist Sitius after all. <laughs> uh, there was another uh, motto that was associated with Baron Pierre de Coubertin, uh, which also honed in on the Corinthian spirit. And that was, it's not the winning, but the taking part. I've never really bought into that particular motto. I can never imagine the likes of Roy Keane, for example, ever uttering uh, those words. 
For many, the spur is the opposite. It's not the taking part, but the winning. And I think the essence of the debate this morning is a tension that lies between those two concepts, between two opposing and contrasting forces. To me, especially after listening to some fascinating contributions uh, from the podium and from the floor this morning, it's striking the balance between them that will be the big challenge for sport in NUIG in the future. Gramila Mahagi. Thank you, Harry. And I think that really did hit the nail on the head, striking the balance between opposing forces, opposing desires, opposing wants, opposing needs, opposing opinions. It's so easy to have an opinion. It's so easy to express it. And it's very generous of the person who's in many ways at the centre of this huge organisation and massively successful organisation. It's very generous of him to come along and to listen to all those opinions which are very passionately and strongly held because he knows that in many people's minds he's the one who might be able to do this, that or the other. But at least in the expression of such diversity this morning, we might get some idea of just how difficult it must be to try and get a balance and try and do what everybody feels is the right thing, when there are so many different versions of what the right thing is. But anyway, just please give a warm welcome to um, the president of NUIG. And once again, I would like to say thank you so much, Jim, for coming here and just closing this conference this morning. Thank you. Yes, you Jim. Carmela Magath, Caroline Agus, Carmela Hagrivera, so Shansa Hort, and Kupla Fall, Fuck the Rally, they got all quite soon to I was on our song, Ben Sean. Get me, I've been in doubt for Shin. So, I have taken about 10 pages of notes. <laughs> That's the first thing to say. And um, I think it's been a, a really important morning in terms of lots of points of view. I'm not going to try to sum them up, but I'm going to try and just give you my impressions of some of what has been said. They're not my final impressions, but they're my sense of what I've heard this morning. And they're initial impressions. They're not set in stone, but they're just giving you my reaction of what I've heard. The first thing to say is I want to thank the people who organised this. I want to thank Sean particularly and the Alumni Association. I want to thank Colin. I want to thank Caroline. I want to thank all the people on the panels. And I need all of you for turning up on a Saturday morning to show your commitment to this university. And that's really appreciated. I think it's also absolutely right that the Alumni Association should do this. The association is there and the board is there to advise the university, and this is exactly what it should be doing, and it is doing that, and I'm greatly appreciative of that. I think also the timing was very good. I think somebody said early on that we're at the moment engaged in a new strategic planning process, and that is a good time for this group to meet and offer advice and to consult and to, if you like, let us hear what, what you've got to say. So what have I heard? The first thing, the passion is clear. It's absolutely clear to me, and it's been clear to me for quite a long time, that sport is important to people. It's important to the university. We recognise that. I think Eamon put it very well. Sport is part of the full university experience, and we certainly respect that, and that will certainly be carried through and into our strategic plan. So we know it's important. We know people want to support it, and we will certainly, uh, we will certainly uh, uh, reflect that. So the issues, the obvious ones are clear, and I think um, Harry put it very well towards the end there. The issue is really about high performance and participation, how you handle both. We have 17,500 students here. About 14,500 are full-time students. The remainder are part-time, mainly adult students. In the 14,500 full-time, we have about 3,000 international students. You should also recognise that. They come with a very different tradition. They're about, we're the highest number in the country. In percentage terms of international students, that might sound strange but that is that is the reality and that probably reflects the fact that we have such a diversity of sport here as well to some extent i think balance is a critical issue as so we have a responsibility to all of our students to our elite athletes and to our uh, wider student body and we're trying to reflect that in our structures we have we had a elite sports officer and we had a kathy who does the more if you like more participation activity and that we try to carry that through into into our approach we have an issue between teens and individuals on the elite side, as well as on the general side. We also know from the work that's been done by the ESRI that there's a move away from team sports as people get older. We know that the dropout rate is huge across all the codes as people go from sort of 14 to 17 years of age, and that people who are involved in team sports tend to 
drop away if they're not really at the at the top level. And that's I think that's evident in lots of lots of different uh, different team sports. And we are that also is reflected in the university. If you look at if you look at data on participation here, and Cathy gave some figures around five and a half thousand students actively engaged. The sports that are really uh, lots of people actively engaged tend to be individual sports and tend to be the less, if you like, um, widely known sports. Uh, you see, you know. Rowing is, is, a, is a, both a team and individual sport, but things like archery, badminton are very strong here. And I suspect it's largely because they suit a lifestyle, they're individual and people can participate, participate at a fairly reasonable level without, you know, without the difficulty associated with organising teams and all the work that goes in behind all of that. And that, I think, is something that we see here and it's not, it's not different to what's happening nationally and it's understood. I really was taken with the notion of dual, dual careers, talking about elite sports people, the notion of a student coming into a university who's interested in whatever his or her sport is, and also, of course, has to achieve on the academic side, and 168 hours per week, and the notion that every, all of our elite people, whatever their discipline, whether it's individual or team, all of them have that tension, and we have to support that, the need for them to, to achieve at a high level in both their academic careers and their, um, and their sports career. I think Eamon also alluded to that, and it's also true that's also my experience that those who are good at sport are also good academically. But there's nevertheless a, there is a there is a, an issue there in terms of how we handle that. I would say that the university is very strong on partnership. I think our success is around building priorities and partnership. That's been that's been achieved on the academic side through research, through teaching programs, through our involvement, for example, with the arts uh, organisations in the city and well beyond the city. The same will have to happen with sport. We will have to engage in partnership with the national bodies in sport. We have a great, we have a great example set, I think, with Connacht Rugby, who came to us to talk about how they would handle the fact that there are now 14 Connacht squad members, students in this university. The word number is 14. Someone said four earlier on. I believe it's 14. Now, those people are, as I understand it, and I'm not certain about this, they're semi-professionals. They have a serious commitment to their sport. And they, Connacht Rugby came to us through their academy to talk about how we would deal with that. And we came to a good solution. We need to do the very same with every other code. We need to do it with the GAA, with the FAI, and so on. It's, you know, that's, that's a way forward. And I think, to me, for team sports, it's, we have to work with the appropriate organisations to build the understanding that we've now done with Connacht Rugby and parallel that across all the team sports to ensure that the elite players on those teams have the same like, access to, if you like, a balance, to deal with that, that dual career issue and, same, and the same supports in terms of the you know, a sympathetic ear from the academics who are involved with them to ensure that they can manage both, because it is a struggle. And that is something that has changed in the past 30 years, 20 years, since many of us were students here, in my case more than 30 years, 40 as Joe pointed out, right? But that, you know, things have really changed. For people of my generation need to understand this, that you know, the university is semesterized now, a, there are exams at Christmas. And that means the end of November. It doesn't mean sort of mid-December. So students coming in here in September are facing exams at that time. There is tremendous competition among students because of the economic climate out there. Students have to engage fully with their work. In the old days, people will remember the St. Patrick's Day was the day that you kind of began to worry about exams. At least that was true in engineering. I'm not sure it's true anywhere else, but that was the reality. That's gone. So there's tremendous pressure on people, and this need, this our need to engage with the national bodies. To, to ensure that we can handle, we can, we can support students who are serious about sport in managing that tension, I think is very important. And I, we are certainly will do that, but we, we can only do it in, in, in partnership with the, with, the, with the appropriate bodies. And I, as I say, I think that the rugby example with Connors is, is a very good one. Someone talked about sport being a vehicle to promote the university. And again, the, the, the example with Connors is very good. The, the, those students have become ambassadors for the university. And part of the agreement is that they go out, and they have done this, went out to schools and talked about their experience as students here, as, in, their, in their case, rugby players. There's no reason the same could be done with the GAA, with the FAI, with whoever, Swim Ireland, I don't mind. It's, it's up to the appropriate bodies to talk to us about that. So part of what we get out of the Connacht piece, Connacht link, is that those student ambassadors going out and talking to schools, particularly to be very frank with you, schools outside of Connacht traditionally wouldn't have considered Galway as a... As a as a, as, a, as, a, as a university.
but now will because they see there's a possibility of doing their sport through Connacht and their education through the university. And that's working very well. And let's repeat that right across all the different codes. Healthy Ireland was launched this week, and, and we have a responsibility to respond to that as an institution. You know, we're all aware of the issue of, Joe mentioned it, obesity, drug abuse, all that stuff. We all know that f habits formed by people who are young tend to carry, out into, carry on into adulthood. The university here has a responsibility to try to promote engagement in participation and engagement in sports for those who, who wish to remain fit and active, and we, have to, we are trying to do that. And that's, that, that also has to be sustained, it will be sustained. The issue of investment. I need to sort of say a few words about investment because the first point is that we don't get money from the state to invest in sport. And we should say that up very, very frankly up front. We get funding from the Higher Education Authority and that investment has to be used for teaching and research. Where we have made investments in sports, those investments come either from philanthropy or more commonly a combination of philanthropy and the student, individual students. So for example, the the fine facility we have that's managed by Kingfisher costs 22 million euros, and that's partly paid for by a student levy and partly paid for by a very large grant through the University Foundation from Atlantic Philanthropy. I think the grant was, correct me if I'm wrong, Thomas here, was it 7 million, Thomas, something of that order? Yeah. So that's where that funding came from. The new facility being built in Dangan will be funded by a combination of student funding through the levy and uh, philanthropy. The university cannot divert money coming in for educational purposes to that. And that's true across the whole, the whole, um, the whole of, the, of the whole the university sector. It's also true that this university was in catch-up mode the past few years in terms of facilities, not just in sport. And we have, we have caught up, and frankly more than caught up. We, had, we were losing staff here because we didn't have facilities to, I'm talking about academic facilities now. And that has been addressed by a combination of state funding and philanthropic funding. And that's why those buildings are going up. And they're all there with that combination of state and philanthropic funding. And they were all necessary to make sure that people in the West of Ireland had the very best facilities in academic terms, in research and teaching terms. And I believe we have that now. Now things are changing. That work is largely done for the next few years. There is no longer a great capital need on the academic side. And this has been discussed with the foundation and the foundation with the university. And there will be a change in emphasis for the future. And that emphasis will, be, will go towards more supporting individual students. It can also go towards supporting sport, and we can do that, and we can, we, we can develop with the foundation a strategy to seek support for sport. And in that context, I would suggest that the alumni are critical. We have been talking to at least two groups of alumni that I'm aware of, and maybe there are others, I won't say who they are, but those who, who I talked about know who they are, about them engaging with the foundation to develop campaigns, to talk to their, like their alumni in whatever football, hurling, whatever it happens to be, to, to get support for that particular sport on the campus. We think there is an opportunity there, that's done in other universities, that alumni groups, if you like, come together as, if you like, birds of a feather in a particular sport, and then work with the uh, alumni association, with the foundation, to generate funds which can then be used to, for example, in rowing, to buy boats, and that has already been done by the rowing club themselves. People like Ch Sean Stewart's company, JSL, I see their name on a boat, Bank of Ireland's name is on a boat. And we need to do more of that in terms of all the other sports. I would say that the university, um, also we need to reorganize ourselves. And I see John Hannan is here. John Hannan is our acting director of student services. And John has been engaged for the past few months with an external consultancy group to look at the whole organization of student services, including the organization of sports services here. And there are ideas emerging from that, which will be discussed at the university management team in the next couple of weeks around how we deal with sport for the future. And I say we do with sport, I'm talking about the organisational support that we provide for it, that we will provide for it. And I would expect that that will include a new director of sport. But I, I don't want to preempt the, the discussion which is going to follow on from the report that John and his colleagues have been involved in. Uh, the interest of the issue of academic involvement. Maybe just two comments on that. The first thing to say, and Eamon will know this, the, the pressure on academics is very high now. It's fiercely competitive career being an academic, fiercely competitive, and there's fierce pressure on individual academics to perform academically, to compete for promotion, and it's, it's absolutely a brutal process. I think Eamon, you will, will testify. We've just gone through it in the past couple of weeks in this university, where 104 people applied for promotional outlets, and we were able to promote 28. And we felt, having gone through a complete assessment, that over 50 should have been promoted. 
That's a measure of the... I'm saying all that because that's in the old days, in the days when I was a student here, a lot of academics gave freely of their time to support sport. That's less... That's harder to do now. I think that's fair to say, I mean. It's harder to do because the, the pressure on those individuals to perform in order to achieve their, build their own careers is making it harder for them to engage voluntarily pro bono with clubs and societies. I think people should, people should be aware of that. The issue of sports science, we don't have sports science. You know, not every university should do everything. What we do have, and this is a well, well, point well taken, we have very strong psychology, very strong medical school, bioengineering, and there are engagements there, and there should be more of those. There's no reason why the national bodies couldn't work with individual academics here, as they're doing in bioengineering, and I'm aware of that example around swimming. There's no reason why that couldn't be done with psychologists, with the, um, with the colleagues in engineering, with the colleagues in, colleagues in medicine, to, uh, to develop research activities to, if you like, advance the particular sport that the national body is associated with. And I would certainly welcome more of that. And that's something that perhaps that hasn't been done enough in this country up to now. I would know Loughborough University personally very well. I've visited many times, and there you see an example of, of sports science, and there you see an example of engagement in sport. But that's at a, a different level, way beyond anything in this country, <laughs> way beyond anything we're even conceived in this country. Like we think of, I'm going to say it now, DCU and Gaelic Games. That's nothing compared to what Loughborough do. Nothing at all compared to what Loughborough do. Those of us who have been over there and see the facilities they have and their commitment to sports science. But they're the only university in the UK who does that. And that's the UK sort of sports university, as I understand it. And it'll be, it may, may happen here the same way, I don't know. Each university will create its own, its own set of expertises, its own set of academic areas for, to go forward with. And I've no wish with us, provided the community agrees, selecting certain sports to go forward with. And I, that's a matter for the sporting community to make its case. And I would say that depends on the sporting community. That's maybe, maybe my final point here. It's up to each club to make its case and to bring forward its ideas, to engage with the university widely and to engage with the foundation in terms of support and make its case. I would say that the headline has been set, frankly, by College Rugby and their engagement with the university. Let's do more of that with all the codes. Let's put in place the type of systems that are necessary to support individual athletes, whether they sit as individuals in their individual sports or whether they sit as members of team of whatever code they, they wish to follow. So, I mean, I probably have missed some points because I'm walking off kind of notes here, but uh, as I say, it's, to my mind, it's been a very important morning. I certainly have learned a lot from it. I, certainly, I think all these are put on the table now. It's up to me and others to sort of take all this and try to absorb it, to work with John and Cathy and others in the university, to, to consult my colleagues on the university management team, to work with the other stakeholders in the system and try to promote a strategy which will ensure that you, the university is recognised for its contribution to sport. I agree it's an important area. I agree that it's potentially a, a way to attract certain types of students, certain numbers of students, but, and, and we will certainly uh, we'll do everything we can to do that. We will certainly try to respond to your clear commitment and your clear passion for sport, and we will, in the strategic plan, we will, we will reflect that reality and try to, try to, if you like, bring forward a plan which will allow us to go forward and allow us to really make a difference, both on the, on the uh, high performance side and on the participation side, because to my mind, the balance, that balance is really important to maintain that. If there are comments or questions, I'd be happy to take them if the, if the chairperson is willing to allow me. <laughs> yeah. So thank you very much. Yeah. yeah. I think it was pretty comprehensive. What do you think? Anybody want anyone or...? or? I think what we should really just say is thank you very much for listening with such a level of attention. And to all of you, I'd like to say thank you very much for your presence, for your attention, for your participation, and lunch is served, I hope. Is it in there, Colm? Yes, thank you very much. <laughs>